Phantom Liberty is an expansion absolutely chock full of tough and morally ambiguous decisions. Throughout your time in Dogtown, you'll have to decide the fates of several individuals and be exposed to some easily missable encounters. And whilst many of these big choices occupy the tough, morally grey area, there are a few which are mostly just straight up downright bad. These can lock you out of a ton of content or just be unnecessarily crappy for everyone involved. Just a heads up, I won't be discussing any of the endings for Phantom Liberty, that's getting its own video. In fact, the furthest I'm going in this one will be up to the quest You Know My Name. Now, let's dive in and figure out just where we can royally screw up. So, for most of us, diving straight into Phantom Liberty after Songbird's first call is no doubt something of a priority. After all, it's not only a better story, arguably, than that of the base game, but also provides access to Dogtown, and with it, a bunch of insanely powerful extra cyberware, weapons and vehicles. Though, once you first head to the Dogtown gate and quote-unquote meet Songbird, you'd better be ready. Everything from Doggy Dog up to Lucretia My Reflection will be entirely time-sensitive and won't allow you to walk away. Or will it? You see, after our initial conversation, where Johnny gets muted from the chat and we thankfully unlock the relic skill tree, there's nothing actually preventing us from simply walking away. And indeed, making our way back into the familiarity of the rest of Night City is entirely permitted, despite Songbird's utter bewilderment. V, there's no time. V, the president needs your help. After a short while, she'll then berate and blame you for killing the NUS president, annoyingly disconnecting from the relic just as I was ordering my drink. Good to see you. How's it going? Fucking motherfucking fuck! What? Congrats, V. You just killed Rosalind Myers and fucked the NUSA. Pray we don't meet again, and I mean ever. Yeah! definitely go for a drink. Tough day. It would seem though, before going, she does take control of our body just long enough to walk me back to the gate and bear witness to the Space Force One crash. Still with us? Oh, what the... What happened? Your presidential rescue op. Miserable failure. Honestly though, good fucking riddance. <sighs> okay, so now what? Huh. We go on living. Start by finding us a drink. Yep, that's what I was trying to do, Johnny. So yeah, it's entirely possible to fail the main quest from the get-go. Though for someone running a total anti-government roleplay run, I guess it's nice to have it included. And better still, all from Phantom Liberty is not lost, thanks to the opportunistic business instincts of Mr. Hans, who afterwards will grant you VIP access into Dogtown. We can still visit the vendors and Ripadox for all that high-level gear, and some gigs and side content will still be available. Not not all, but some. Sadly, the latter half of Mr. Hand's gigs will remain locked, since you'll never have cause to meet him, which is the trigger for the new gigs in the game. And only a handful of side quests will ever be available too. As an extra bonus, we do get a second chance to back out here, and this one has far less dire consequences. Basically, once you bring Solomon Reed to Myers, you'll have this dialogue option come up. It's not a bluff. Selecting it, then confirming with the next option, will end the main questline too. Though in this scenario, Rosalind does get back to Washington, and Reed does kindly inform you that all went well before permanently severing ties. We do eventually get contacted by the American Animal Defenders Association too, and a tipped 5k, as a clear anonymous thank you for saving Rosalind. You do overall get a tiny bit more from doing this one, such as the Chimera Call, but again, tons of side content will still remain locked. And despite the fact that Mr. Hands will in this case display 10 gigs to complete, subsequent jobs never seem to unlock after the first five, at least for me. Again, not quite sure why you do this aside from some specific roleplay, but kudos to the devs for allowing this silliness, and actually accommodating for people who for some reason choose to miss out on more than half the expansion that they paid for. Next up is a mistake that's way, way easier to screw up on. A kind of almost nothing moment that can have some truly dire consequences further down the line. During Lucretia My Reflection, when traversing the tunnels after we defeat the Chimera, we'll be presented with a fork in the road. Now, choosing to turn left will mean everything should be fine. You'll head along a mineshaft, through a sewer, and get to the exit with no issues. But turning right, where you have to shut off the gas valve, will mean you're unexpectedly spotted by cameras. Not a problem 
them. Of course, there's no enemies down here and you can shoot them anyway if it makes you feel better. Shortly after, you'll probably move on and forget all about them. At least I did. Enter the elevator and visit your future Dogtown apartment, the worst by all standards, and continue through the story. When Jacob and Taylor arrive, obviously spare them because it turns out they're pretty decent tombs and extra protection for Madame Prez. Taylor is an ex-nomad who betrayed his family but seems a little more honourable now, and Jacob is an amputee thanks to Colonel Hansen but has high hopes and big dreams. He asks for a million eddies and any model of Rayfield, to which Rosalind candidly replies, Tell me where you want it parked. And yes, we can find later she does fully intend to stay true to her word. Her personal notes confirm this. But here's the thing. Case may be that J and T don't actually live long enough to enjoy their insane stroke of luck. Because it turns out those cameras were feeding intel direct to Barguest. And come the next day, when in the car with Reed, we will be waylaid and forced to fight goons both on the road and back at the building. Jacob and Taylor, in this case, honoured their their agreements and went down defending the president. Sad, unnecessarily so, and all because of our sloppiness. But here's how to avoid this, even if you do turn right back in the tunnels. All you have to do is switch on the laptop in this server room, which I honestly thought couldn't be interacted with at all the first time around, but from this terminal you can wipe any recordings made of you and Rosalind. Now, the following day, you and Reed will be completely uninterrupted in your journey, and no one unsavory will be waiting at the building. Jacob and Taylor will still be there and you'll be able to bid them farewell afterwards. Now this feels a lot more hopeful, though one smidgen of doubt still remains. That is, when we text Reed asking about how these two are doing, we get this ominous, not particularly elaborative reply. Quote, they've been taken care of, no need to worry about them anymore. End quote. Hmm. I don't know about you, but this does very much make me worry about the fate of Jacob and Taylor, and offing loose ends certainly aligns with FIA protocol. My slither of hope is in the fact that Rosalind was planning to anonymously pay them, no doubt again via the American Animal Defenders Association, though by the fact she sent us just 5k for doing a hell of a lot more, perhaps she did just think it easier to off the two in the end. Nevertheless, wiping the recordings leaves us with more hope for them, whereas not doing Doing so means a straight up definitive death. If anyone has found any further signs of these two in the world, happy or sad, please comment it below. And for now, let's just picture them driving into the sunsets in a Caliburn or Arendite. No Easy Way Out is most famously a song by Robert Tepper that plays in Rocky IV, fitting then that it should relate to a new side quest about a boxer. Aaron has been figuratively trapped by the animals into allowing his fights to be fixed. They implanted him with a brain chip which can be remotely activated to send him down whenever they want. They can literally control when he loses. So Aaron wants this chip taken out and his freedom restored, meaning we have to fight through a base of scavs to get to the Ripper who can perform this operation. All appear appears to be going swimmingly, until just after the op, where we're met by Angie, a distinctively non-animal looking member of the animals, who explains a few more things to us, like the fact that Aaron used to run with the gang, and it was only through being a violent thug in the first place that he could actually afford the implants which make him a great fighter. It's because of this that the animals have him under lock and key. He literally owes them a debt for granting him the power in the first place. Of course, we know from other encounters with the animals that that debts very often aren't squared away fairly. So who's to say whether Aaron truly should still actually owe them or not? What we also learn, however, interestingly, is that Angie never actually used the chip on Aaron to forcibly send him down. She never needed to. He always did as he was told and took the profits from it. And now all she asks is that Aaron throws just one more fight, the biggest fight of his life. Of course, to those wanting to stick on side with the guy who hired them, there's one blaringly obvious solution. Solution. Much as Angie is, how do I put this, one of the best YouTube thumbnail NPCs in the game, killing her will free Aaron from the animal's clutches or so it would seem. He'll later text us and say he's still lost the fight, but not for lack of trying, and wants to meet up in person to say thanks. Of course, the problem is that the animals gang didn't stop at just Angie, and by the time we get to Aaron, we're a few moments too late. He was taken to a nearby alley and beaten to death. It's kind of a nice wake up call this, to make us realise that we can't simply shoot every problem away, but it is no doubt tragic, and a bad way for this story to end. Only caveat is that by doing 
doing it this way and shooting Angie, we will get her iconic unity pistol, Cheetah, which deals more critical damage the closer you are to an enemy, and looks pretty cool too. I'll rank it alongside the other guns soon. However, other choices here can result in a much happier ending for everyone involved. Letting Angie have her way and fully maintain control over Aaron will keep him alive, but as you probably could have guessed, she does not actually cut him loose after throwing that next fight, instead saying this. Aaron, what awaits him? He's our guy. We'll take care of him. Guess he thought he could get rid of the chip and the past. But that just ain't how it works. I think he understands that now. On the plus side, we get 10k eddies, but precious little more. The better way to end this, in my opinion, is by playing the Sasquatch card, an easy and surefire way to actually strike fear into these three animals. They'll afterwards leave you alone, and by extension, Aaron too. I guess Angie remaining alive, but knowing you're capable of taking down her boss and protecting Aaron now, means she doesn't let anyone make a move on the guy. From doing this, you have two more options. Either convince Aaron to still throw the fight, or do his best to win. He won't win, even if he does try, after which he'll move to Costa Rica, apparently, and start trying out as a fighter there. Not quite sure what the gang scene is like over there, but here's to hoping for a better future for our guy. Equally, telling him to throw the fight, still out of fear for his life, is a surprisingly good way to resolve things, contextually. Aaron will realise there's more to life than just him as a boxer, and will shortly after start training young kids. This is the most wholesome ending in my book, and allows Aaron to reconcile with his past as a gangoon and turn his life around to do something genuinely good. Also, it provides a nice foil to the abhorrent method used on young sports stars during the Talent Academy gig, if you played that one yet. Here's a cool side quest with potentially dire outcomes. Balls to the Wall involves us meeting and making friends with the two bar guest soldiers Paco and Babs. Not only that, but it also involves a flashback hallucination scene wherein we literally kind of play as Colonel Hansen, fighting against scavs and stealing their stolen generators. During which Paco relays his tale of winding up in a big mess. See, this guy was tasked with transporting said generators for the Colonel, but unwitting opportunistic gonk that he is, Paco thought it would be a good idea to sell off said generators to afford himself a quick extra buck, utterly neglecting the issue of how Barguest is going to respond when they find out their new recruit lost said precious cargo. After the flashback's over, Paco and Babs turn to us for help to get out of their terrible predicaments, for which we have several options. This is one of the reasons I said in my review that you probably want to complete the friendship quest lines from the main game if you can before embarking on Phantom Liberty, since the final choice of these relies on said friendships. But the first choice is objectively the worst here, at least for the immediate future. Trying to par off the loss of the generators on Yuri, a Barguest soldier already in Hansen's bad books, may not sound like a terrible idea. However, it is. It so is. Babs immediately suggests we continue this conversation the following day nearby, by which time, of course, the damage has been done. Yuri himself comes for us, initiating a mini boss fight, and afterwards we learn why. Yuri, you see, obviously clocked that Paco had stolen the generators and had thus ratted him out to Hansen. In response, the colonel ordered a public display of punishment, a warning against the other soldiers who defy him. Paco's body is found hanging nearby, his head having been bashed off like some negan level shit just a few hours prior. Though screwed up as this already is, this ending can get technically worse, if you're so inclined. See, messaging Babs to ascertain whether she's safe, she'll ask about Paco. And, uh, well, we can tell her and say we're really sorry, or we can pretend that he's probably fine. Doing the latter, she'll explain she's escaping on a flight to Kenya, and booked him a ticket too, at the expense of all her savings. And, thanks to you, she'll be left wondering for the rest of her life just what happened to her best friend and why he never contacted her again. Really, truly awful, especially when we look at the alternatives. See, equally, we can offer to smuggle just Paco out of Dogtown, with him in his lead plate car boots, and this does result in both surviving, for now. But when we find Taco outside the afterlife, he'll proudly declare he's joined one of the most horrible and abhorrent gangs that you possibly can, the Scabs. And if you've done the Sweet Dream side quest before this, then V will say this bit of dialogue. You're kidding, right? Scabs? Of all the things you could have been, you choose to be trash. Once took in a spiked BD, woke up soon after in a scab den. Was this close to being carved up, turned into scop. 
Gotta make a living, don't I? Not only that, but it's made clear that this ending puts Paco and Babs in direct opposition now, one day perhaps being forced to kill each other on the field of battle. We do get the iconic Umbra called Carmen though, which deals increased limb damage and works best whilst on the move, so at least there's that. We also get this however in either of the two best endings, for which you'll have to have completed either River or Pan Am's quest lines. With the Aldecaldo help, both can be smuggled out of Dogtown and make their way to Kenya, for real this time together. Alternative Alternatively, River can lift some different generators from NCPD lockup, allowing both of these two to remain in Barghest, having hopefully learned their lesson. For both, we'll get the Carmen from a crate in the tent where we first met. Which is best out of these two? Tough to say. Dogtown ain't exactly a good place to be, so I suppose it depends on the state of affairs in Kenya. All I know about it in 2077 is that it's the headquarters of Orbital Air, so who knows, maybe both of them wind up with a cushy job at the spaceport and don't have to worry about dying every day. That said, Megacorps ain't exactly healthy workspaces which care about their employees. So what do you think Paco and Babs would prefer? Either way, it's got to be better than working for the scavs or, you know, just straight up death. For those unaware, You Know My Name is a Bond song by Chris Cornell, which plays in Casino Royale. I can't play it, obviously, but I think it's very underrated if you go and listen to it. Fitting, as well of course, for the Casino mission, given that that movie is a high stakes game of poker, and this mission is, well, similar. You Know My Name was one of my absolute favourite quests for Phantom Liberty, namely because of just how many familiar faces we get to see and meet there. Indeed, the core spy element here is really cool but I think one of the worst decisions you can make in the entire expansion is to get drawn too heavily into the stakes of this mission. It's easy enough, especially as things progress, to feel like you ought to be getting a shift on, though part of that is no doubt down to the fact that this feels ripped straight from a Bond movie. Or actually, more accurately, this mission in particular reminds me of the party scene from Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. You know, what with all the blue holographics and stuff. Seriously though, give yourself time to breathe for this mission. I know it's annoying because you can't sprint, but visit every balcony, every alcove, every table. There's both an insane level of lore and callbacks which can be found at this place. So here's just a few. Remember that time Takimura got mistaken for a celebrity presenter, Hidashi Hino, and we made him recite that line? Beta Bakurap! Hino-san, what happened to you? I do not know. I do not recognize myself. Well, what do you think? Whilst nowhere near identical, I can certainly see plenty of resemblance. The best part about this though, is we can literally have a conversation with Hideshi about Takamura. You look exactly like my friend Goro Takamura. Did he also just get out of rehab? Also, there's a ton of TV stars here. People we hear all the time across the city, see on TV screens, and listen to whilst booting up the game. They'll either shrug you off like the street level scum that you are, or they'll try and flirt with you. You can also head to the Overlook to hear about some of the insane arms deals which go on here. Oh, and there's also another cat. A particularly important guest, it would seem, and maybe you can discuss some theories as to why in the comments. Mr. Hands is also here, of course, and several others. Though the most notable and easily missable one can only be seen and spoken to on our way out, after a particularly intense encounter wherein you will probably feel like you need to rush. But make sure not to miss the chrome lady that we all know and love, Lizzie Wizzy. Or Lizzie Wizzy's unwitting engram copy perhaps, as I theorise in this video. It's a somewhat insightful encounter as to her mental state and a great follow up to the violence quest. But also by speaking to her, you can acquire one of the coolest headpieces in the game, simply by complimenting it. It doesn't do anything specifically along with most of the other clothes now, but it does look hella nice in menus and on bikes. Now sure, just missing the extra stuff and encounters here may not be a terrible choice with dire consequences in the same sense as others, but I do think it was absolutely worth mentioning. Since this party is teeming with cool stuff, and Lizzy Wizzy especially, is surprisingly easy to breeze past, so I hope I helped. But comment below any more genuinely bad choices you think you might have made in Phantom Liberty. And Perhaps I'll look at them in a future video. I've already got a ton more stuff to discuss about this expansion, but I'm always open to extra ideas. As always, massive thanks to the patrons for your continued support of the channel, and thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.